Uh, uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Ning Guanting and um, this is my topic Empowering 597 Future Change Makers. And uh, because I, I'm not sure how much time will I spend, maybe like over time, I hope not. So I prepared this one. Uh, you will see the QR code on almost every slide. So so it's fine if you don't scan right away, you can scan later and you can ask questions later. And uh, if I don't have the time to answer the question, I can uh, reply when I, uh, when I finish, after, after I finish this thing. Okay, so this talk is about uh, a 150 hour experiment of a liberal office curriculum. Uh, taking place in the Taiwanese junior high school with uh, almost 600 junior high school students. So, mm, I would like to address one question first. Why teach early? Um, think back uh, for a moment. Can you recall like any experience from your youth that actually affect your life profoundly? Uh, for me, it was a really simple introduction for Ubuntu, the uh, operating system. Uh, during just a 40 minute informational technology course uh, in, in my fourth or fifth grade. So instead of Windows that we usually use in Taiwanese classroom settings, uh, our IT teacher let us explore Ubuntu. So I was really hooked at the time, so I installed it on my computer and I, I played around with it. And I even wrote like a year-long school report on that subject. And it was selected to be presented in like a, a big like a thousand people from all over the city. So this is definitely a small start, a, an elementary school student doing a school report, but it did reach another thousand people. And also it set things in motion for the later parts of my life. So after elementary school, I started writing more papers and uh, get involved with local tech communities. And uh, I started writing more, more and more that actually did reach uh, hundreds of thousands of people and uh, one of those articles uh, is about how the government uh, is buying software from Microsoft illegally and, and it actually triggered a response from the government and uh, so some might think okay that's just one person's journey from, from a single class but consider this one uh, if you can spark just one per one student's engagement uh, out of almost 600 people in this experiment, if even just one person, it can reach to another hundreds of thousands of people. And especially in today's generation, uh, growing up in the digital world, uh, they are really ready to dive into uh, doing more things and and who knows like a small spark in this classroom it may actually turn into large impacts in our communities tomorrow so um, this is the experiment this is the chosen students and the course so there are 597 uh, 7s and 8s uh, great Taiwanese students, so around they are in their early tens, and uh, this is in the really urban and efficiency first, meaning exams first. Uh, New Taipei Public School, just outside the capital of Taiwan, and uh, it was between April and June this this year, and um, I had uh, eighteen classes during the same curriculum. Each class took about 8 to 12 hours in this course. And each student uh, they can access on one Windows 10 PC. 
in during the chorus. So the classroom looks like this. Okay, so this is the place I teach. Maybe I should wear Windows logo. But okay, let's talk about the curriculum. Um, because I I try to not to focus too much on the software. In my age, it was all about how to use the software. The first class of the course is how to find the start button on on your Windows device, and I think I think that's that's the the past. We don't have to do that anymore. Students are born with smartphones, so instead, I chose to focus on the philosophy. Uh, I want to defend the importance of free and open source software in this age of cloud, especially when uh, the line between uh, apps and websites and a lot of things are really blurred and students are, they don't really have a concept of, uh, of apps anymore, they're just using the cloud and it's even harder for the free software and the open source community to come in. Uh, in some senses. So uh, I want to bring the values of freedom, the values of choice, the values of uh, making your own thing into tech education. Um, so that's my curriculum. But what about the national IT curriculum? Um, so this is how a textbook of um, uh, junior high school IT class look like. So um, they, they will spend around 90 hours in computer classroom throughout three years and so about 45 minutes each week or in my case 90 minutes every bi-week. They do it twi uh, twice a month. So in our new curriculum just started like five, no, four years ago. 56% uh, of the time is devoted to algorithms, uh, including tools like Scratch, like um, uh, App Inventor or Python even. And they spend most of their time learning loops, learning if-else, learning variables. That's the majority of our IT curriculum right now. And 14% uh, focuses on ethic, uh, laws and security, so how to avoid like online bullying, uh, how to uh, be secure, how to not get hacked when you use your smartphone. And uh, this 14% does not include uh, the creative commons and copyright laws. It will be talked about later. And 30% uh, is about general IT knowledge, so about like, computer history and uh, how computer systems work and uh, how internet works, so something like that. And also 11% is about data handling. So um, in this case, uh, I, I calculated the teaching values from this specific textbook called Hartley. And um, in this version of textbook, it uses uh, Excel and Google Sheets as uh, data handling examples. Uh, it does mention LibreOffice in the curriculum, but only just an uh, honorable mention, not really using LibreOffice. And, uh, but some textbook, they do use LibreOffice, so it's a matter of uh, choice. Uh, not, it's not fixed in our national curriculum. So, uh, other than that, uh, there is 3% of copyrights and CC. So, the, probably the only thing, the only philosophy thing that the Floss community cares about is CC, and it only takes three, less than 3% of the time in our curriculum. And uh, another final 3% is uh, assigned to uh, digital media, like how to uh, s use sound samples, images, and uh, use tools like Audacity in our textbook. So, 
Okay, um, this is our national curriculum. So you can see that there's actually not much concepts about open source, not much concept about free software. But as a government paid teacher, how do I integrate my thinking, my uh, values into the national curriculum without like try, trying to make it completely something else? How to justify teaching liberal office? How, how to justify teaching these values? So, but I, I think it's actually you can you can justify it easily if you dive deeper on each uh, subject. For example, algorithm. We use Scratch. Probably like almost every IT teacher in Taiwan starts their class with Scratch, and. And Scratch is a perfect example of uh, free software. How uh, students may not understand why is there software that we can use it for free, and when we go home we can download it and use it for free, and it doesn't contain any ads. It's weird to them, but uh, as long as we introduce the concept of the software and the licenses, they can they can get more understanding of uh, free software, the basics, and. And so on. Uh, for example, like security, how free software can be more secure. How we can uh, audit the source code, source codes together, and uh, probably the inherent spirit of free software and open source spirit of I IT. And um, when we teaching, when we are teaching data, we can just use Cal. We don't have to follow the textbook because. Or it's also about uh, it's still aligned with our curriculum, so we don't have to use Google Docs if the teacher doesn't want to, or we don't have to use Excel, and so on. We can uh, make everything. Actually, everything comes back to the philosophy and comes back to the values we believe in. So, with that in mind. Uh, this is my teaching plan for a ten-hour class. Okay, so you can see um, uh, the liberal office curriculum is uh, around eight to twelve hours. So this is a ten hours of average class takes a class like this. So I spend about two hours on basic concepts. I teach about uh, what's the difference between conventional software and free software, and we talk about file formats. How uh, the simple uh, file extension can can affect our document readability. So ODF versus OXML, the Microsoft format, and also we talk about uh, public money, public code, which is a, a political statement that requires our government to uh, to prioritize free software when making or uh, purchasing software. Uh, so we talk about this, and it links back to our democracy values. We believe in a transparent government, and so with these basic concepts, there is an exercise we uh, ask students to maybe identify and uh, analyzing how free software works, and the uh, the licenses comes come with the free software. Also, um, the other two hours uh, is case studies. Um, there are two layers of case studies. The one layer is software. We, uh, I chose LibreOffice as, as this is a productivity tool that students actually can use. And uh, I mentioned Scratch, which they use a lot in other courses. And um, Macedon, the uh, Twitter alternative. And Firefox, we talk about software, the licenses, and how they can make the software better. And also, we uh, we explore the case of policy. Uh, we use videos and handouts to teach students how to uh, how to see our uh, national software purchasing policy. And uh, there's uh, some materials about the EU, uh, maybe that things in German, Germany, France, and we talk about procuration and purchasing. So case studies. Then um, I try to use four hours 
and it, it's proven that it's too short later, but I didn't know at the time. So uh, I, I took four hours on uh, group researching and presentation making. So uh, I already come up with some uh, topics and I helped students choose uh, their interested topics from the list I make and uh, they can have uh, some materials that I found for them and they can research on the basis of this. So topics include the things I mentioned before, the basic concepts, the case studies. Also, I, I like them to explore the difference between uh, LibreOffice and proprietary software with the intention of, uh, I want students to realize Okay, free software gives you free, free things, the freedom and the choice while not compromising too much on the functions. I, I, I try to do the compar compar uh, comparison for this intention. And uh, finally, there's the presentation and note taking. I, I want students to uh, help each other learn by giving a presentation and taking notes on other people's words and so they can learn from each other and learn from the topics they choose. And the final grading is, uh, it depends on how the quality of the presentation is, of course, and how well it's perceived by other people. So if, okay, I can, I'm a junior high school student, if I can teach my pupils about ODF clearly and easily and people can take good notes, so they get good grades, and I also get good grades. And um, the file format must be ODF. I don't care about what software they use, but I encourage them and I teach them how to use LibreOffice to finish basic tasks. So this is my, uh, this is some example slides of uh, basic concepts. This is about public money, public code. And uh, if I translate that, it's something like this. Uh, I try to make uh, this concept simple and easy to remember. And I will try to link it with their other experiences in life. They watch TV news, politics news every day. So they are familiar with those terms like transparency, government, and uh, how to like business com com competition. And uh, we talk about how uh, open source and free software can benefit our society and our political system as a whole. And uh, in terms of case studies, we talk about something like uh, maybe Macedon. So, uh, like, just for reference, about one third of my students use TikToks, and about ninety percent of my students use Instagram and about 10% of my students use Facebook. And anyway, uh, they are all in so deep of um, social media, and so I spent some time on a decentralized Mastodon, the uh, Twitter alternative to, to teach them how to uh, care for their data, their, um, and their uh, the algorithm, the, uh, teenage issues of social media in this uh, part. So, case studies. Uh, the other case study is about the policy, the real policy happening in uh, Taiwan. Of course, I try to simpl simplify a bit. So, uh, we teach about the concept of vendor luck and how um, like different divisions of uh, the software industry can lock one user in in the proprietary ecosystem forever by forcing you to up upgrade this person, upgrade the other. So I try to teach them with uh, graphics and the real case that happening in our maybe local governments and our national uh, central government. And this is the group presentations. Um, of course, uh, for privacy reasons, the, their face look weird. Um, so uh, they, they choose from the topics I, I decided. And for example, this one is uh, their, uh, their take on interoperability. And they, so 
in order to get good grades, they try to use simple languages to make every other students understand this concept in a really short time. And, uh, and I think uh, maybe half of them do a great job in presenting a really complicated concept like this one. Uh, the other half uh, needs a little more work, and I will talk about that later. And uh, we also ask students to compare different, uh, different software, uh, LibreOffice and uh, proprietary software, especially Google and uh, Microsoft. Uh, I wish, uh, this is something I, I wish I could see, uh, not many students can do this way, but they can compare the same function on different software and, and see the reality that uh, a free software is not that different from a commercial software and you get so much more uh, values out of free software. So this is something they made in their presentation and And let's talk about the things I learned. Okay. Uh, so the challenges I faced in, in my journey teaching LibreOffice to junior high school students, there are really some key challenges. The first one is cloud-centric mindsets. So they are just cloud natives. I, uh, I asked them what's the cloud and they never thought about it. And when I tried to ask them to do presentations with LibreOffice, they asked, uh, they just asked, okay, so after maybe there's a bug or something, the, the software crashes and the file is, is gone and they are so shocked because they don't know the concept of saving. They don't know the concept of offline files. So, and also they, they kind of require collaboration. Uh, they want to see like, other group members' uh, things at the same time. And the reason of this, not just because they are born in this era, uh, their parents give, give them the things, but it's also a responsibility of the educators, because the schools, especially during pandemic, we uh, adapted Google solutions a lot. Uh, so virtually every, every student in, my, uh, in the school I taught has to have a Google account. They are required to have a Google account to, to receive the education. And our, uh, our IT department uh, rely everything on Google solution and uh, our classroom we use a lot of Google products, a lot of cloud products. And so, so the big question here is something like, where are our files? Students don't know that. And um, how are the big companies use those files? How are they analyzed? How are they stored? And uh, when, when you graduate, uh, can you delete your files? Or can, can teachers even see your files? That's some uh, scary questions, but no one actually ever thought about uh, students, not, not us. So, so this, is the, this is the first challenge, the cloud-centric mindsets. Not just students, but also teachers, also our, our IT departments. And also the second challenge is that IT uh, it's not a uh, language course, it's not math. So it's not a major subject there in Taiwan. Therefore, it's not part of our high school entry exam. So remember I mentioned it's an efficiency first junior high school in, near the capital of Taipei. So uh, the school just doesn't care, just doesn't care about the subject. We, that's a double-edged sword. Uh, on the bright side, nobody really cares about what actually happened inside the classroom. So we can teach whatever we want in reality. We can, we can teach them to 
uh, not to use Microsoft because it, it, it's evil and nobody will give, a, give it a second thought, maybe. But the other, the other downside, the, the, the flip side is that you, it's really hard to encourage students to do more, and to learn more after class. So we only meet twice in a month, and sometimes when there's festival, when there's exams, we meet may maybe like one time or none in a month. So how can we encourage them to study, to, to learn about the values and to do things after the course? It's, it's a big challenge. And the third one, as you can see, the curriculum, our national curriculum, it lacks uh, free and open source concepts almost completely. And um, the current curriculum does uh, give a chance to use tools like Scratch or App Inventors. They are all open source, but we, in the curriculum, we use it as a tool. Not uh, we don't we don't dig into the significance behind these tools, the the values, the licenses, the way you can collaborate with the software development team. And it's a big shame, it's a big waste to, uh, to, of, of the opportunity. And the last, last one is the increasing digital divide. I'm not talking about, okay, some uh, rich kids, they have iPhone, they have MacBooks, they have things. But in poor kids, they don't even have internet. It's not like that in Taiwan, especially in, in my school, because it's an urban school. So in, in this case, the thing is more about uh, the mindset. Uh, it's more about belief systems. So maybe older generations like us, we appreciate the freedom and open source philosophy. But the younger ones, the one third that uses TikTok, uh, they, especially in the Chinese language TikTok, in Taiwan we use Chinese language, and if they use the Chinese language TikTok, they uh, can lean more towards supporting government control from the Chinese sourced videos. So uh, it's, it can be, students can divide a lot, not just how much wealth they have and their digital literacy, but also their belief system. So some, some students can actually support like a proprietary over open source because they think, okay, more control means more security. And it can be, it can be really hard to navigate, especially it can be sensitive in our uh, political environment. So to reflect on the challenges, we, uh, I think I gathered some lessons that I learned uh, that I believe I can shape our teaching methods in the future. So the first one is to simplify the materials. We all know there are, there are multiple communities, there are multiple open source communities, and there are a lot of uh, complications inside the communities. But uh, I tried not to simplify too much to give context, but I was wrong. The students uh, could not lose me from time to time. So just simplify that, to try to focus on how to give the good values to the most of people. But still, we have to allow uh, critical thinkers, they, the students who think fast, and they, uh, when they try to criticize all my, my course or my curriculum, uh, I have to allow the space and the room for them to think, to develop their thinking. So the second thing is uh, uh, to personalize for uh, potential contributors, especially maybe those critical thinkers. Uh, there are always high achievers in the classroom. And uh, while our course is designed for the, the most people, there are some people, they are already doing uh, coding and or doing Python or even C++ and they want to do something in the real world and uh, I, I think 
this is a really good opportunity for them to go into the world, to go into the community, and do some contributing. And and just like uh, yesterday, I remember there's an uh, Indonesian junior high school student who's organizing this incredible study group. So I think we can encourage things like this. But of course, as teachers, we have to uh, ensure they are in a safe environment, safe first, and also they the necessary manners uh, need to be taught. Like you cannot believe how how ill mannered sometimes they are on the internet. Uh, like for example, basic email uh, formats and how to do basic interaction with other people that can help you contribute the most and help you to be safe. And the third one is to adapt for the cloud natives. Okay, so uh, we talked about how students don't know anything about saving. They don't know what the weird uh, square shaped icon is. They've never seen a floppy disk. So we need to start, we need to plan ahead. We need to think about our gener generational gaps. It's a huge gap. And, and we do what our resources allow. Uh, if, okay, like in my case, it's a big school. I cannot afford to, to manage a, uh, maybe a server for, for the school students. But I can teach them how to save. It's within my course time. And uh, I can propose some alternative uh, collaboration uh, methods. If I, even if I cannot provide an online environment for them to collaborate, they still have the old school way to, to collaborate, right? So, but if, if you do have the resources, if you do have the time and the money, you can build a server and even you can teach students who are interested, te teach how to build servers and they can build their own, they can share it with their friends and it will be really fun. And the, the last but not least, the, the lesson I learned is to stick with the values, to remember, always remember software is not just a tool. Uh, our IT class focused too much on the tool side of, of the software, how to use the tool. But it's intertwined with, the, this tool is intertwined with our social fabric. So it shapes how we interact, how we communicate, and, and how we think even. So as we evolve the technology, uh, we should also just pause and consider the broader implication of our choices. So, so the ethics behind the platforms, ethics behind the tools, and we need to prioritize openness, transparency, collaboration, and thus contributing back to our community. So, um, so as educators, uh, students are always curious. They're, they're always like they're seeking advice. Most of the students do. And when they do reach out, you have to prepare. You have to know what, you, what, what is the right value to teach and how to teach them in the simplest way to make them understand and, and help them uh, go into, go deeper. And uh, when we pass this knowledge, we ensure how this can guide them towards uh, the choices the values in our communities and benefit both the individual student and the uh, society. So I hope uh, by sharing this uh, this experience, uh, I can help uh, educators, teachers, or even just parents around the world, uh, around Asia, to reflect how we can teach our lessons. And I, I look forward to suggestion and questions. And um, I think we still have maybe one or two minutes. I'll see if there's any questions. And thanks to our sponsors. Let me see if there's questions.